Hey, hey, hey. Hi, guys. Welcome to Macro Markets, where we analyze how the macroeconomic news and events impact the crypto space. I'm your host, Marcel Pashman, veteran stock markets and derivatives trader analyst at Cointelegraph. On today's Macro Markets show, we'll be explaining NVIDIA's earnings and buyback impacts, besides the recently released stock market incentives in China. Today's show will start by discussing NVIDIA, the chip maker that is at the center of the artificial intelligence revolution. According to the Reuters headline, NVIDIA's $25 billion buyback plan results lift stock to record high. Shares of NVIDIA rose as much as 6.7%, hitting an all-time high after the company unveiled a $25 billion stock buyback plan. The company beat analyst expectations when it reported second quarter revenue of $30.5 billion after the bell and predicted revenue that would reach $16 billion in the third quarter. Okay, so what exactly is going on here? How exactly can a handful of tech companies drive the S&P 500 index 15% gains year to date? Well, for starters, Apple, Microsoft, Amazon, Google, and Nvidia, those five companies combined accrue for 25% of the index, composed by the largest 500 tradable companies. That's because those tech giants have huge market capitalization values, mostly due to high margins, growth perspectives, and profits. So basically, if a sector starts making big money for a couple of years, investors will tend to concentrate their bets on those stocks, which causes the price appreciation and subsequent share increase in the S&P 500, not the other way around, meaning there's no vote or decision to whether some company or sector should have an increased or decreased weight or share in the S&P 500 index. It's market capitalization based. Okay, so now that we've covered the basics of the S&P 500 weightings and reviews, let's try to understand why the hell Nvidia suddenly became an important part of the economy. According to Yahoo Finance, Nvidia's latest gross profit was nine and a half billion dollars in a single quarter. But notice what else happens here. Their normalized income was almost $6.2 billion. Let's find it. Yeah. Net income, $6.2 billion. Which is an incredible margin, given that the gross profit was $9.5 billion. I honestly don't recall that many companies that can achieve such a margin, so it's impressive. Moreover, if you analyze it, so you multiply by four, since that's a quarter result, you get to the number of $24.8 billion of profit per year. To put things in perspective, that's enough profit to acquire General Electric or Siemens, all in cash, in just five years of profits. There you have General Electric, the rank number 114 in the tradable assets, market cap $133 billion, Siemens, another huge company, secular company, 116 rank of market capitalization, market cap $118 billion. So if Nvidia sets aside five years of the profit, it's worth, it's enough to buy those, one of those two companies. Now let's forget about the trend and potential of artificial intelligence for a second. Even if you believe that the market is cyclical and that it may have picked NVIDIA is currently valued at $1.13 trillion. So there you have rank number 8, NVIDIA $1.13 trillion, right behind Google and Amazon. So this puts the company in a position for merger acquisitions that could easily target the incorporation of competitors such as Intel, valued at $142 billion, or AMD, valued at $166 billion. So those acquisitions could either increase the NVIDIA's market share or simply eliminate a competitor or threats on pricing, which is also beneficial for NVIDIA. But 
We're still missing a main point here, the buyback, the $25 billion buyback that was announced. Nvidia is basically using cash that belongs to investors, meaning profits generated by the company to support the, the money is being used to support whatever price level the stock is currently trading on, regardless of it being sound or cheap. Yeah, it's utterly unethical, but that's the standard in stock markets. So it doesn't matter if you hold 10 shares or 10% of the company, there's no way for you to block buybacks that are approved by the company's board of directors, which, by the way, are the most benefited by the stock price, meaning the CFOs, CEOs and directors usually have compensation plans directly linked to the stock price performances. So according to the ratings at Nasdaq.com, NVIDIA price to earnings ratio, which is the main measure of a stock is being is trading overvalued or undervalued, is trading at 67 times earnings. So the market value of the company is 67 times higher than their annual earnings. That compares to Google's 19 and a half or Microsoft's 30 times earnings. So Nvidia is two times more expensive than those companies, even accounting for 180% growth rates on the earnings. So yes, we're already accounting for a major earnings growth for Nvidia, but still the stock is overvalued in terms of PE comparing to Microsoft and Google. Crazy, right? I know, but as long as there's enough cash being generated, meaning earnings and profit to support more buybacks, betting against stock is usually not a good idea. Even if there's a recession, those companies have high margins and strong cash positions, so they're well positioned to buy competitors or simply take on a hit for a couple of years on lower revenues. In a sense, that explains why the tech sector, or five companies, represents 25% of the S&P 500, surpassing giants such as ExxonMobil, Johnson Johnson and Walmart. The secret is high margins and earnings growth, which is more likely to occur in sectors that are more directly impacted when technology changes. That's why I personally don't consider stocks, especially the global 500 largest companies, as a competitor to cryptocurrencies and Bitcoin. Quite the opposite. There's simply no relationship between a company's capacity to generate earnings and the money being used for the payments or to acquire the stock, whatever it is gold coins, Bitcoin, or some lousy fiat currency. So I see no relation in the price of Nvidia or the S&P 500 and Bitcoin's performance. One is a commodity, other is a stock or an index compromised of stocks that generate earnings and it's usually a good investment if, the, if those companies can achieve earnings, margins, growth, etc., independent of them being traded in gold, in dollars, in euros, or whatever. Just to highlight, that's my own personal opinion, and it does not reflect Cointelegraph's official view. Now, let's move to the Asian markets. The Bloomberg red line hates. Markets show China needs a stimulus bazooka to woo investors. The CRI 300 index surged as much as 5.5% before ending August 28th, up 1.2%. While the gains helped pair part of its losses in August, the Chinese shares are still one of the world's worst performance among the more than 90 equity index tracked by Bloomberg. So the Chinese stock market pumped 5.5% in the opening, but ended up closing the day up 1.2% on August 28. The pump was likely due to a multiple reasons from the Chinese government that seem particularly aimed to manipulate the stock market. Number one, authorities reportedly asked mutual funds to avoid selling on Monday. Number two, special refinancing conditions for the troubled real estate sector. Number three, regulators reduced fees 
to stimulate buybacks. Number four, some trading firms reduced margin requirements for leverage longs. Number five, expectations for the regulatory hurdle for new stock offerings. So it will be much more costlier or more regulatory complex to issue new shares to do IPOs in China. And finally, number six, restrictions for the recent IPOs, the one that have already launched to sell stocks below the issuing price. But it quickly became evident for the market participants that none of those measures were actually designed to stimulate the economy, despite the initial headlines calling it a stimulus measure. According to Ting Lu, chief China economist at Nomura, the measures over the past weekend are not enough to stem the downward spiral, and their impact will be short-lived if not followed by measures for supporting the real economy. Without additional and more aggressive policy, policy stimulus, these stock market-focused policies alone have little sustainable positive impact. But besides the lackluster price performance on the CSI 300, there's evidence that foreign money is fleeing away from the Chinese stocks. Global funds on Monday sold the equivalent of $1.1 billion of mainland shares on a net basis via trading links with Hong Kong, according to data compiled by Bloomberg, that took outflows for August to over $11 billion, poised to be a record. Now, the question is, why isn't China launching real stimulus packages? And the answer might hold on their currency value. So the yuan price chart in US dollars show that their currency is reaching their lowest levels ever, meaning one needs 7.3 yuans of the local currency to get one dollar. So you can see that it reached one of the highest levels ever, meaning the peak was October 2022, around 7.35 yuan per dollar. So we're pretty close there. So regardless of the incentive coming from tax breaks, government bond buybacks or money being distributed to the population, that will eventually translate to more money in circulation and increased debt, therefore negatively impacting the yuan purchasing power. It's definitely a tough spot and has no easy answer, but most likely China is going to face a much lower growth rate. Now, who is the biggest beneficiary of the Chinese stock market outflow? Well, United States either via cash, meaning US dollar getting stronger, or the S&P 500, which also helps to fool the US currency. So you can see that DXY index, which measures the United States dollars against a basket of foreign currencies, have recovered from mid-July at 99.5 to the present 104, so also nearing the highest levels in the year at 105. That's bad news for Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies, given that they're priced in US dollars. So a strong dollar is not a good sign for Bitcoin. And also Bitcoin competes as a store of value against the dollar. So if the money is flowing away from the Yuan and the Chinese market to US dollars and the S&P 500, that's also bad news for Bitcoin as a store of value. Remember, to succeed, the US dollar doesn't have to be a perfect instrument. It just needs to beat competing fiat currencies, at least in the next four years. Well, that's it for today. I hope you guys enjoyed the show. Remember to like and subscribe the new Quantelegraph Markets and Research YouTube channel. See you.